during my first year in, in graduate school, which was 1952-53, in the spring, uh, the double helix structure was announced, and it literally changed biology. Biology became a very different thing. It wasn't just recording unusual phenomena, uh, but began to make sense. So I decided that I would like to go and be a postdoc with Chris Anfinson, who was the great protein chemist those days. And Joe Fruton surprised me when I went and asked him to write a letter to Chris. He said, no, you shouldn't do that. And I said, why not? He said, you should go work with Leon Heppel. And I said, Leon who? Because I had never heard of Leon Heppel, nor had many people. But it turned out Leon was one of two or three people in the United States who was doing nucleic acid chemistry and enzymology. And Joe somehow knew um, that that was a good thing to go and learn. So I did that. About 18 month, after 18 months, the lab chief, who was a very distinguished uh, carbohydrate person, Bernie Horaker, um, he appeared in the door of the lab one day, and he just said to me, would you like to stay? And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, you get a regular job, and you can have a lab, and we'll get a technician for you. Um, so I said, sure. And that was how I got to the NIH, which was good, because in those days, uh, although I didn't know it because I was quite naive, I would not have gotten a job in a university because they are not, we're not hiring women faculty in the sciences or many other places. I would tell them to go for it, uh, if that's what they wanted to do. Um, I would tell them that they should go to graduate school, and um, if they have a partner uh, and they want to have a family, they shouldn't postpone it. Um, I've seen a lot of my younger colleagues, some of whom have waited till they finished a postdoc, um, and others who've had children when they were in graduate school. And I think the ones who do that earlier are better off. There's no question that it's easier to raise kids when you're young, because it takes a lot of energy. Uh, and um, you're also more likely to conceive when you're younger. So that's a biological fact that you have to live with. And I would just say, you go for what you want to do. And you don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Or you let them tell you, but then you ignore it. My husband Dan and I have four children. They're all um, between 40 and 50 at the present moment. And um, I was very lucky that the recombinant DNA thing didn't explode until after they were all old enough to uh, sort of manage. Uh, because if it had happened 10 years before that, uh, I never would have managed. So, um, yeah, so first of all, Dan is extremely helpful. He was never afraid of diapers and things like that. Um, secondly, uh, we hired a lot of help, which was important. And we had a student who lived with us and helped on the weekends. Uh, and I didn't need much sleep. It's important to know it's a very small institution and dedicated to its independence, which was very nice. Um, so one thing was that I got to know more about other sciences than the science I'd been involved in. So I've learned to be at least an amateur reader uh, in nature and science of papers on earth science and astronomy, um, plant biology, uh, and I never would have done that otherwise. So that's really been wonderful and it's remained with me. The second thing that I'm very proud of is the fact that um, I was able through one step uh, to improve the institution's endowment, which is very important because of this notion of independence and about 60, 65% of the annual budget is money earned by the endowment. So that was really important, and I did that with one thing. And that was, I recruited in 1990, David Swenson to be 
on our board and chairman of the Finance Committee. The third thing I would say is that we started the first new department in 75 years uh, in, as a way to celebrate the centennial of the institution, and that's the Department of Global Ecology, and it turned out to be just the right moment uh, for doing that. And the fourth thing is that um, I recognize that while the institution had been headquartered here in Washington uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, uh, that it, it was unknown in the city and had no connection to the city at all. So I began a whole bunch of efforts in science education. And those went on without me, uh, but once I retired, I started working. The educational system in our country uh, needs a huge amount of help. And it's not just Band-Aids, and it's not just more of the same. Uh, I'm really struck by the fact that in education, including in the things, some of the things we've done at Carnegie with teacher institutes and things, uh, when you sit back and think about it, we're doing what scientists would never do in the lab. That is, if you do an experiment and you do it twice and it doesn't work, maybe you try a third time. But after that, you change what you're doing. And the people in education don't ever do that. They just keep trying the same thing over and over and over again. And it's particularly striking in science and math. Um, I've come to the conclusion uh, that uh, a big part of our trouble is the fact that the people teaching science and math particularly grades 6 through 12, don't have the knowledge of the science and math um, that they need to have to teach. If you think about how we encourage young under, undergraduates to, go, to become graduate students in, in science, we, we offer them fellowships and we pay their tuition and they go through graduate school and they never have to spend a penny. They don't have to go to their fathers and mothers or anything. But if you, are, if you excel in math or science in college and want to be a teacher, you pay your way to go and get a master's in teaching and a certificate. So I think we need a big program for offering people who want to be teachers in math and science the same kind of thing that we offer those who go to graduate school because then doing that becomes more attractive to people. And we all know that everybody who goes to graduate school ought to go to graduate school uh, and we should encourage them to be teachers, but we should encourage them with a carrot uh, and pay them uh, to do that. And I really think that's important. There isn't one answer to that and it's a moving target that what was important and worked in 1975 is not necessarily going to work in 2009. And I think that's important. And it's, that's true because the world around us has changed so much. And um, so I don't believe in prescriptions. But I think the academy is a very good place uh, to try and advance uh, science policy. Uh, because it's deliberative and thoughtful and can call on the right scientists from all over the world, really, uh, to grapple with a particular issue. But on the other hand, uh, the academy is quite conservative. And so uh, we need sometimes to have the ability to move faster, move more aggressively, and perhaps take some risks in what we say maybe has to be corrected after a while. And for that, I think individual spokespeople, people with charisma who understand the science and who have a window um, or opportunities to speak to the public. I think that uh, this was one of the strong points of Harold Varmus's tenure as the NIH director because he did he did capture people's attention and people listened to him. Um, and I'm hoping that um, the great crew that uh, President Obama has put in place will do the same thing.